Iceland was first discovered over 1,000 years ago during the Viking Age of Exploration. This led to Iceland being mostly inhabited by a Norse and Celtic populace, which would heavily influence the nation for the foreseeable future. Ever wondered how the Vikings developed Iceland into a prosperous country? Well in today's episode of Everything History all will be explained. Due to the discovery of Iceland taking place some time ago, there are only two legitimate sources that tell us about the period of settlement which took place roughly from 870-1200 CE. The oldest source, Slendingabok, the Book of the Icelanders, written in about 1130, sets the period of settlement at about 879-30 CE. The other main source, Landnamabok, the Book of Settlements, of 12th century origin but known only in later versions, states explicitly that the first permanent settler, Ingelvar Arneson, came from Norway to Iceland to settle in the year 874. Once Arneson set up a homestead he named it. Reykjavik, now the capital of Iceland, in which he farmed with his wife. Even though the majority of settlers came from Norway, there was still a lot of settlers that came from other Nordic kingdoms within the British Isles and the Baltics. Thus the Icelandic language is considered a Nordic language with it being similar to the dialects of Norway. Icelandic literature is heavily influenced by their religious beliefs in gods which they called Asa. Believe it or not the gods Thor and Odin from the Marvel franchise were both derived from Icelandic literature. In their religion Thor amassed the most popularity whilst Odin is thought to have the highest rank of all pagan gods. After the Nordic settlement period had ended, the Icelandic assembly was introduced, called the Althing which was held in the middle of summer. The assembly comprised of a council that had the ability to make and amend laws, it also had a court of justice which consisted of householders that acted as a panel of judges. At the time farmers had to belong to a chieftaincy, but were given the right to change their allegiance when they wanted to. This form of rule has been resembled in many modern societies. No one had complete power over the nation, but it wasn't a complete democratic system. The economy of early Iceland is thought to be rather prosperous, the land had an abundance of sheep and cattle, but due to the only wood being accessible was birch, they had to import different woods and more for good agriculture growth. To a large extent, Iceland was ruled separately from Norway. It had its own law code, and the Althing continued to be held at Thingvalia, though primarily as a court of justice. Most of the royal officials who succeeded the chieftains were Icelanders. In 1380 the Norwegian monarchy entered into a union with the Danish crown, but that change did not affect Iceland's status within the realm as a personal tax land of the crown. The decline of Iceland's economy came in the 14th century when both Norwegian and English merchants began fishing in Icelandic waters. The Danish crown tried to stop English trade in Iceland on many occasions, but lacked the naval power with which to defend its remote possession. One of the royal governors was killed by the English when he attempted to stop their trade, an event that led indirectly to a conflict between Denmark and England in 1468-73. In the early 16th century England abandoned the idea of fishing in Icelandic waters as they had found more success in their discoveries in North America, which led to the Germans taking over the main Icelandic fishing routes. The lack of birch wood was slowly becoming more and more of an issue as the nation's deforestation led to more imports from other countries, draining their own economical strength. The 18th century was a time of decline and increasing poverty in Iceland. Famine which was caused by a volcanic eruption and subsequent years of cold weather, plagued the country in the 1780s and killed one-fifth of the population. However, these hardships bred little criticism in Iceland of the country's status within the Danish realm. In 1809 Danish adventurer Jorgen Jorgensen managed to seize power in Iceland for two whole months. When he was removed and Danish power restored, he received no support from the Icelandic population. Five years later, when Norway was severed from the Danish monarchy and given much greater autonomy under the Swedish crown, there wasn't a push in Iceland to demand the same from Denmark. The period of Home Rule, 1904-18, was one of major progress. Motors were installed in a lot of the open fishing boats, and a large amount of steam-driven trawlers were attained. The nation was connected by telegraph cable with Europe. School attendance was made compulsory for children in towns and villages, and a number of schools were built. The University of Iceland was established in 1911 in Reykjavik, which by 1918 had a population of 15,000. All restrictions on the freedom to move to the fishing villages were either abolished or quietly forgotten. There was a radical transformation in the occupational structure of the country, which in turn led to the advent of a labor movement. The German occupation of Denmark in April 1940 effectively dissolved the union between Iceland and Denmark. A month later British forces occupied Iceland. 
In 1941 the United States took over the defense of Iceland and stationed a large force of 60,000 in the country. The foreign forces brought employment, prosperity, and high inflation to the population, which then numbered about 120,000. This was vital for societal and economical gain. The war made it extremely hard for Iceland and Denmark to renegotiate their treaty. In spite of great resentment in Denmark, the Icelanders made the decision to terminate the treaty, break all constitutional ties with Denmark, and establish a republic. On June 17, 1944, now celebrated as National Day, the Icelandic Republic was founded at Thingvallir. Since then Iceland have managed to increase their economical strength and improve relations with nations such as the UK and US. And joining NATO was a massive help in securing Iceland. Thus the 200-mile limit was introduced which prevented the likes of the United Kingdom and Germany from fishing in Icelandic waters. Have you ever been to Iceland? Let us know in the comments below. Who would have thought such a small nation would have a large and rich history? We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Everything History.